Man, as you take your seats, open your Bibles to Romans, Romans, Matthew chapter 7. Wrong book, Matthew chapter 7. What a joy on the first day of this brand new week to get to gather together as the body of Christ here at Harden Baptist Church for our 915 service. Thank you, thank you for being here this morning. You know, I don't see this as often as I used to. But there's been a few times in my adult life when I've driven up to someone's property and they had the big sign saying, beware of dog. Now, I don't know about you, but if a property owner feels the need to post a sign telling me to beware of dog, I probably should beware of dog. And now I'm not thinking about them and I'm not thinking about how beautiful their property is. I'm driving down the driveway looking for the dog. I don't know what you would do, but I'll tell you what I do. I stop in the driveway, wait a few minutes, turn the truck off, actually give the dog time to reveal himself. Dogs don't always do that. So now I'm waiting for the person to come out of the house because I know they've got a dog that they want me to be aware of and they don't come out of the house. I've got a decision to make. I get out of my truck, but as I get out of my truck going to the porch, I'm looking for the dog. And, and you can always hear them coming. And when you hear the noise, I'm wondering, is it a German shepherd? Is it a Rottweiler hoping it's a Chihuahua that I'm going to be dealing with? Imagine driving up on the church parking lot, and I had this big sign saying, beware of wolves. That would be strange, right? Now, what immediately should go through your mind if we put that sign on the church parking lot is, why would they want us to beware of wolves? And the first thing I would want to remind us is this, who we are. According to the Bible, if we're followers of Jesus, we are sheep. And sheep are prey animals. In the food chain, we are not the king. We are at the bottom, and there are many animals that prey on us. And one of the animals that loves sheep is an animal called a wolf. Jesus, as he comes to the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mountain, warns his followers about wolves. So this morning, it's not going to be a popular subject. It's going to be a warning subject. If you know Brother Ricky, it's not my nature to like to speak about these kind of topics. But when you're a pastor who preaches through the Bible verse by verse, you can't skip this. Would you stand with me and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7? I want you to see this title, Beware of Wolves, not as a title to a sermon, but a big billboard, a big sign. Of Jesus warning us of the danger and the deception of wolves. As we read through verses 15 through 23, please hear the heart of Jesus. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? This has to be one of the saddest statements in Scripture when Jesus says this. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Father, Father, you know this is a difficult passage of Scripture to me to preach as a pastor. Father, you know I like to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. But yet as a shepherd of this church, as a person who's been called by you to teach your word, I can't. Because there are some your son told us we can't give the benefit of the doubt to. We've got to be on the lookout for. Father, I have the responsibility when someone drives onto this parking lot and attends a service here to make sure there are no wolves. But boy, when we drive off of this parking lot, we're still sheep. And there's some wolves out there. So please let us hear the warning to beware of false prophets. Father, I need your anointing this morning as I preach like I always do. Can't do this without you. You know my heart, I do not ever want to be a speaker only. I want to be a doer of your word. And I know the heart of this congregation We do not want to be hearers only. We too want to be doers of your word. So impress your word upon us as Jesus concludes his famous Sermon on the Mount. We thank you for your anointing you're going to give us now as a hearer and a speaker. And it's in his name, of course, we ask you. Amen. You may be seated. I want to acknowledge right up front that God and I have talked this week and At first, I thought this warning was out of order. I thought Jesus should have finished his sermon, then after finishing his sermon and given the invitation for us to follow him, then he warns us. But it's not what he does. So we're going to try to the best of our ability to preach this passage in its context. And Jesus now, as he concludes his sermon, says to those on that mountain who are going to follow him, beware of false prophets. We understand from our study of the Old Testament that God called certain people to be prophets and they would prophesy God's message to his people. Moses, being in the line of the prophets, spoke about a prophet who would come after him, speaking of Jesus, but then he knew before the Messiah come, there would be other prophets, and he actually wanted the people to understand that not everyone who claimed to be a prophet would be a prophet. There would be some prophets who would be false. They would prophesy falsely. When they opened their mouth, they would not be speaking on behalf of God. So in Deuteronomy chapter 18 Verses 21 and 22, the question is, how may we know that the word of the Lord has not been spoken? In other words, how do we know if you hadn't spoken to a prophet who says you spoke to him? And then here's Moses' answer, verse 22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So this was real simple. If someone made a prophecy, said something was going to happen, that if you do this, this will happen, and then you do it, and it didn't happen, that guy's not a prophet. Real simple. But some things aren't that black or white. 
So by the time we come to the prophecy of Jeremiah where God's prophesying to the children of Israel that God's going to destroy the temple, he's going to take the southern kingdom into exile, there were prophets who were saying this isn't true. They were warning the peace that Jeremiah was overreacting and this was a time of peace, not a time of concern. So in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 16 and 17, here's what the Lord says. Thus said the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hope. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say, continue to those who despise the word of the Lord. It shall be well with you, and to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. Now, by the time we get to the New Testament, we understand from the day of Pentecost that there's going to be a radical change in prophecy. A prophet is not going to just speak about something that's going to happen in the future. A prophet now is going to take God's word and he's going to announce it to God's people. And then he's going to announce that there's going to be consequence depending on your response to what God says is true. Now here's what's amazing. When the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit fell upon the church, Peter quoted the Old Testament book of Joel chapter 2 to say that what's happening now in the church is fulfilling what Joel talked about, about the last days. And one of the signs of us knowing we're in the last days, one of the signs of knowing that the church is filled with the Holy Spirit of God and we've been baptized with the Spirit is that prophecy will not just be reserved as a calling and a gift to men, but that everyone in the church can have this gift. Old men, young men. Old women, young women. Your servants, male or female. And throughout the book of Acts, we see ladies who actually had the gift of prophecy and prophesied. Now, Jesus is going to give a warning that as followers of Christ, there are going to be people who are going to say they're speaking on behalf of God and they're telling us God's truth. But what Jesus wants us to know, that not all those prophets are genuine. They're not all true prophets. Some of them are false prophets. The word for false here in the Greek language literally means they are lying prophets. What's coming out of their mouth, what's coming out of their life, you can't trust. It's opposite of truth. It's opposite of genuine. It's opposite of, opposite of sincere. So he's warning us about false prophets. Look what he says about them. They're deceptive. What you see is not what you get. They're dressed in sheep's clothing. Meaning what? When you look at them, they're going to look just like you. They're going to look like a sheep. And your first response to them is you're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, remember in Jesus' sermon, what's he been telling us about righteousness? We can't have a righteousness like the scribes and Pharisees have, a righteousness that just conforms to Law, outward conformity. What kind of righteousness does Jesus want us to have? He wants us to have an inward righteousness. He wants us to be right with God, and then from that right relationship with God flows our outer righteousness. So we're not trying to conform to law. We're trying to conform to the heart and person of Jesus Christ. Agreed? So what do we know about these false prophets? Well, they've got outer conformity. They look like a sheep. How do they look like sheep? Because you can put them in sheep clothing. And what this is referring to is in the biblical days, shepherds would wear sheep clothing. Not to look like a sheep, but to identify with the sheep as a shepherd. And what they did, they had a sheep skin that had been cured, still had the wool on it. And on a cool night, they would sit with that skin inward and the wool outward. So if you was approaching from a distance, you really couldn't tell the shepherd from the sheep. But when it got really cold, that shepherd would turn that wool in and that skin out 
And that's the primary reason he wore the sheep's clothing was to stay warm. And now Jesus takes that picture and says to us, be careful, church. Be careful, follower of me. You're a sheep. You're a prey animal. Beware of the false prophet because really the false prophet, even though he looks like you outwardly, tries to conform to some of the same standards you conform to inwardly, he or she is a ravenous wolf. Just doesn't just say wolf, ravenous, fierce, destructive. And it's the picture of a wolf preying on a sheep. And he literally devours the sheep with his mouth. Using his paw and his mouth. After taking the life of the sheep, he literally tears it apart limb by limb until there's nothing left of the sheep. And that's the picture. That's the picture. Wow. This blows my mind, but it hurts my heart to know there are people who prey on and are out to destroy the sheep of God. Amen? And Jesus warns us about these people. Now I want you to see the context. I told you before that I thought originally this was out of order. I thought this should go after Jesus talking about the two builders. And I thought verses 21 and 23 ought to follow verse 14. But Jesus is the perfect teacher, amen? He doesn't make mistakes. How dare I be a pastor and criticize Jesus' sermon on the mount? Can't do that. So after wrestling with this and wrestling with this, here's what I believe. If I keep this in context, as Jesus begins the conclusion to his sermon, he tells us there's two gates. One's narrow, one's wide. Depending on which gate you enter, the way is different. One way is easy, the other way is hard. There's two different destinations depending on which gate you go through. One destination is destruction. The other destination is life, eternal life. And there's two different crowds of people. There's the few and there's the many. Now, why after telling us there's two different gates would Jesus now warn us about false prophets, false teachers, false preachers? People whose messages are not true. Meaning what they say to us, we cannot trust and we better not trust. Because the effect of their words on us is just like the effect of a wolf on a sheep. I think you get it. I think what Jesus is trying to say is, you better listen to me. There's just two gates, and there's just two ways, and there's just two destinations, and there's just two crowds. But there's going to be some people among you who you're going to think is church, who you're going to think are sheep, and they're going to contradict this message. And the contradiction of their message primarily is going to be this. You can live the life you want to live, and that life will not lead you to destruction because God is a God of love. He's not a God of wrath. He's not a God of justice. And he just wouldn't send somebody like you to hell. He just wouldn't do that. So here's what 
false prophets primarily do. They tell people it's okay. Meaning what? There's really not a life of destruction. You're not really going to pay for what you do. It's okay. God understands. And all of a sudden, it's not the narrogate that's hard that leads to life. The wide gate does too. Now let's remember this. Corey aced this, if I can say that. What does it mean when you enter the narrow gate? It's hard. Why is it hard to enter the narrow gate? Why does just a few find it? Because here's what ultimately salvation is. It's about you coming to the end of yourself and recognizing there is nothing you can do as a sinner to earn a right relationship with a holy God. And your only hope for salvation is to trust in the work of another. God's work in his son Jesus Christ when he put his son on that cross to die for your sin. Bear your eternal punishment. Face the wrath of God. Be separated from the Father. So that ultimately you could receive eternal life. And that eternal life not be something that happens in the future. But something that starts the moment you repent of your sins and put your faith in trust. And it changes your life. Hardest thing a sinner will ever do. And that's why most don't find this gate. Remember that other gate? That other gate's a life that we didn't choose to enter. Mom, dad got us through this gate. And this gate's wide. And this gate's easy. Why is this gate wide? Why is this gate easy? Because entry through this gate is we receive a sin nature. I am so thankful that modern science is finally agreeing with what the Bible teaches. And that is there's some genetic things that we inherit from our parents that determine behavior. Praise God. Amen? Science catches up with the Bible. But think about this. I've received some tendencies that I got from Adam and Eve. And it's just real easy for me to believe that's who I am. It's just real easy for me to say, well, if God made me this way, then this must be okay. Therefore, there's never a need to Repent of being a sinner or that particular sinner. And somehow the false teachers tell us that we can mingle all of this together because God is a God of love and there is no consequence, there is no destruction eternally or presently for the choices we make on how we want to live our life because ultimately. All of us should have the right to choose. I was in Brazil. One of my pastor friends sent me this article. It's only rare that I can get things in Brazil, but this came up on my phone. Historic Kentucky church calls gay man as co-pastor. Not California, not Chicago, not New York City, not Washington, D.C., Kentucky. Church had already went down the road that a lady can pastor a church. And so now this church took another step alongside that lady to call a gay man to be pastor because this church wants to minister to part of the community that they feel the church has abandoned and does not minister to. 
Can I tell y'all how that breaks my heart? Not because a church called a gay man, but because here's the message from the pulpit of that church. You can choose a life of homosexuality and marriage as a homosexual. And there is no consequence to you with God at all. Do any of us believe a church is going to call a man who's gay to lead the church and then tell the people in the church he's going to hell because of his lifestyle? There used to be a time When folks struggling with that genetic tendency, and it's a genetic tendency, it comes from Adam and Eve, it's sin nature. Brother Ricky could counsel, our staff could counsel, and if someone refused to listen, they would move to Louisville or Memphis to practice that lifestyle. Now you can go down the road and find a church in western Kentucky. That says there is no eternal destruction. God will not judge you if you practice this lifestyle. There is no destruction that comes to you in this life right now if you choose this as a lifestyle. And you can still believe you're saved and pursue this life of sin. Breaks my heart. To know that one of the most historic churches in our nation has a pastor who is running for a Senate seat that he's already won in a special election in the state of Georgia, in the city of Atlanta. And his belief is it's okay for you as a woman to end the life of that baby in your womb. And we're talking about the pastor of a historic Baptist church in our nation. We've got denominations who are dividing because there's part of the denomination that believes when you're born, you can't look at the baby and say the baby's a boy or a girl. Because gender is a choice you choose. It's not something that's a part of God's plan and the birthing process. Jesus warns us, beware of these false prophets. Beware of these false teachers. And I want to go further to say this. Beware of these false churches. They are not speaking God's word. And yet some of us watch them on TV. And you think it's okay when it's not. Please. I can warn you of what goes on in here, but I can't warn you of everything that goes on out there. But Jesus warns us about false teachings, false prophets, false prophecies, false preachers, false churches that do not stand true to two gates, one being narrow and the way hard, and it is hard. It's hard to denounce a sin tendency. Tell me you know that. Tell me you've been there. Tell me you've struggled with this. Tell me you've experienced the life change that God brings to you. That gives you victory over this. And we can go on and on and on and on and on and on. 
Because that same church is going to tell you it's okay to gossip. That same church is going to tell you it's okay to cheat. That same church is going to tell you. Yes, it's easy for us to pick out the one we're not doing. But that's not what Jesus does here. You cannot believe, even in your own life, that you can continue to have a sinful lifestyle and a sinful tendency, no matter what that tendency is in your life, and still be right with God. That's why salvation leads to sanctification. And that's why we in the church aren't judging. Because every time we see this, we understand what it reveals in us and that secret sin in our heart and our life. But here's what Jesus is ultimately teaching. Because I'm saying, God, if they look like sheep but they're ravenous wolves, he says, well, by their fruit you will know them. By their fruits. And then he switches to a tree analogy he talks about a you can't get a grape from a thorn bush i know that you can't get a fig from a thistle i know that what's he trying to say if you sat under a false teacher if you sat under a false church if you sat under a false prophet it's a contradiction healthy tree can't bear bad fruit diseased tree can't bear bad fruit healthy tree produces good fruit diseased tree produces bad fruit And he comes back again and says, by their fruits you shall recognize them. How do I recognize a false prophet? When the way they lead people does not lead them to salvation, but it leads them to eternal damnation. And you don't want to believe that's true. But it's true. The Bible is clear on the plan of salvation. The Bible is clear on the way of sanctification. This ain't Brother Ricky warning you. This is Jesus warning us because he ends his sermon with this warning. Because there's just two gates. There's just two ways. There's just two destinations. And there's just two crowds. I really wish here Jesus would have said what the fruit was. Not everybody's going to agree with me on what I think the fruit is. But basically the fruit is their teaching and their lifestyle. God's given us his word and we base all our teachings on the word of God. We cannot change them. And God's word talks about a lifestyle that comes out of someone who is a sheep of God. Please hear me. There are churches who teach that all you got to do to be saved is say a sinner's prayer. And then once you say that sinner's prayer, it doesn't matter how you live your life. There's no destruction for you. You got eternal life. That's a lie. If you really put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's a change of life that comes to you. That change of life is what gives evidence that you really are right with God. Now, please understand, there are some things that we can teach wrong that doesn't mean we're a false teacher or a false prophet. Can I be lighthearted here? Some of you know me. You can differ with me on Romans 7. That doesn't mean you're a false prophet. It just means you're wrong about Romans 7. When it comes to Reformed theology, you can be a five-pointer, unlike me, a four-pointer. Doesn't mean you're a false prophet, but it just means you're wrong. You can believe that the rapture starts before the tribulation instead of after the tribulation, like I do. Doesn't mean you're a false prophet, but it means you're wrong. You see that difference? There's some things we can disagree on because it don't affect salvation but there's a thing 
some things we must all agree on. And that is God's not going to let sinners who practice a lifestyle of sin into heaven. Yes, the gate's narrow. And not everybody finds it. Because it's hard. Hear me say this. The hardest thing you'll ever do is to repent of that sin nature that you received from Adam and Eve. And it gets even harder when you got somebody telling you, hey, it's okay. That's not really separating from you from God. That's not really bringing destruction upon you. Please, church, let's beware of the false prophets. He doesn't just talk about two trees. He talks about two testimonies. Look at this. Verse 21. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Can you imagine being a preacher? Can you imagine being a teacher? Can you imagine being a pastor of a church? And you're claiming, Lord, Lord, and on the day of judgment, God says to you, you're not going to the kingdom of heaven. Breaks my heart to think that some of us sitting here may be saying, Lord, Lord, but we're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. See, you can not only be a false prophet, you can be a false professor. You can say you know something that you really don't know. And that's Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Who's going to enter the kingdom of heaven? He who does the will of him who sent me. Now, I want to make sure we don't misunderstand this. Don't slip into a works-based salvation. What does it mean to do the will of God? Well, let's turn to Jesus' words in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Now look at this next verse. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So what's the work of God? God wants us to believe what? In him who Jesus sent. Who, whom he sent. Who did he send? He sent Jesus. So what does God want us to do to do the work of God? He wants us to believe in Jesus. Got it? Now let's go to verses 39 and 40. And this is the will of whom sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Please hear this. What's the will of God for you? Not just to look on the Son, but to believe in the Son. To come to that place where you repent of being a sinner, put your faith and trust in Jesus, receive the new nature of God, and then what does God promise you? Jesus on the last day is going to raise you up. And that's what it means to do the will of God. Not to profess with your mouth only, but to believe in your heart. And to believe in your heart means you commit your life to him. You quit trusting in you and your decisions, and you trust totally in his finished work on a cross for you. And that's hard. It's not easy. And there's going to be few that go this way. And many are going to go this Last thing. On that day, can you imagine this? On that day, hear me, on that day, on the day of judgment, there's going to be a group saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Lord, Lord, didn't we do mighty works in your name? And Jesus said, I'm going to say to them, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I never knew you. There's going to be people who on the day of judgment are going to cry out, God did not do all of this for you. And 
And he's going to say, you know my name, but I don't know yours. You know me, but I don't know you. How, how do we reconcile this? How do I reconcile this? Do you realize how hard it is to be a pastor in this day and age? And to stand for the truth of God's word? And to break people's heart? See sin devastate families? See, on the day of judgment, what people's going to go back to is works. God did not do this for you, did not do this for you, did not do this for you. And, and it boils down to, where's our trust? Our trust is in us. Our trust is in, I make the right choice about my life. It's about faith in me. And if you have any faith in you of what you do for God to make you right with him, he doesn't know you. The ones who he know are the ones who abandon faith and trust in themselves. Don't make their own choice. Let him make his choice for us. And we reveal his kind of life. Not our kind of life. Can you imagine on their opinion, on their judgment? God looking at somebody? He's saying, I don't know you. So can I just say this? I believe it's more important for God to know us than it is for us to know him. You know whether or not he knows you. Does he know you? You said, Brother, doesn't this scare you a little bit? Yep, it does. It scares me a lot. I hadn't had this happen in a long time, but I've had people ask me early, Brother, what are you going to do on the day of judgment? God sends you to hell. I say, I'm going to hell. And I tell them, God has the right to send me to hell if God wants to send me to hell. And, and, and what they're really trying to ask me is, what are you trusting in? And here's what I tell people. I mean this all my heart. If I stand for God on the day of judgment, and you're all there, and you're going to see this. If God sends me to hell and says, I never knew you, you are not going to hear me say, but I pastored Hardin Baptist Church. I give up being a farmer so that I could pastor a church because that's what you wanted me to do. You're not going to hear me tell him about all the mission trips I went on. You're not going to tell me, hear me tell him about all the late night hour conversations I had trying to help you. You ain't going to hear me bring up any of that stuff. You know what I'd say to God if God sends me to hell? I'd say, God, that's fine. But just know, I'm going to hell, but I'm going to hell believing in your son, Jesus Christ. Because I believe in God's son, Jesus Christ. Now, is a believer in Jesus Christ going to go to hell? No. Am I going to hell? No. The reason I believe in Jesus is because God knows me. And my relationship's not one-sided. There's a lot of you that think you know LeBron James. You think you know Tom Brady. You know all their stats. But you don't really know them. Because they don't know you. Can we just close with this? Does God know you? Have you seen the change in your life? Are you a slave of righteousness or are you a slave of sin? Let's pray. Father, Father, you know I'm aware of everything I've said this morning.
And you know I only say it in the context of the church. Having to be aware of false prophets. Us teaching that it's okay to have a lifestyle of sin. And because of your nature of being a God of love, He would not send us to hell. Father, please bring purity and holy to your holiness to your church. Let us continue to be compassionate to those who are in a lifestyle of sin. But let us not be like the false prophets and say it's okay or believe it's okay. We can't just pick the sins we're not committing. Father, you warn us. There's a danger to us as a church, as sheep, if we fall to the ravens' attack of the wolf. Father, convict us. Help us point people to the narrow gate. And it's in your son's name we pray.